And they were like certainly a bit different than uh, uh, the American artists who were all kind of scruffy. Uh, you know, they were, they were the only artists in suits. And, uh, and they really made a big impression with suits. And, uh, and, and this, 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 I remember I was at that performance, it was really very good. And, uh, and, uh, and just the fact that they were English and had more suits. <coughs> And uh, where Dennis Oppenheim and Vito Conchi, I mean, they just, I, I've never ever seen them in anything close to suit. And, uh, uh, and um, uh, you know, that was that. And Vito's a, uh, a performance in Sunderman Gallery a couple years later. Of both, actually, both of those performances, uh, Gil and George and Vito, uh, were both at uh, Sunderman Gallery, the second floor above uh, uh, Elia Costello Gallery at 420 West Broadway. And Vito did his famous uh, masturbation piece, which uh, we had discussed uh, earlier, uh, and he, which was a, a platform in the gallery where it, the viewer would walk into the gallery and uh, uh, and become somewhat elevated because it was a the whole floor was like became a wedge, and Vito was underneath it uh, with a microphone, uh, and a speaker was on top, and he was. Uh, Basically, fantasizing to anyone, who, uh, fantasizing about anyone who was walking on top of him. So he was like masturbating and fantasizing uh, to the unknown person whose footsteps he heard above him. And uh, you know, but I had, you know, even though that was done recently by a, a woman uh, at the Guggenheim, recreated. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think it was important that. Uh, Vito was doing it, and I think it was also important that Gilbert and George were doing it, and they, I think, recreated it years ago. I, I couldn't see any other two people doing that. No. Who had one comment? The old yeah. shows are still out about 1970. They were performing just across the road in Andrew Greenberg's gallery in the place. And the whole school was right down there. But the funny thing to me was not just that, but they were building George at one end with a table or a deck before it. Everybody else was pressed against the back wall. It's like it was so unreal to see people being sculptured, they were pulled hmm. away from it. I know that happened in New York as well. I remember this being, it was, they kept on doing it all afternoon. I, I think they, 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 it was a kind of cyclical thing that they kept on going back, but it was a very full afternoon, right. you know, of uh, people coming and going from the gallery. But I think it was a whole afternoon's performance. Really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's, uh, you know, th those were some of the things, those were some of the things that people were doing, uh, and I think that it, I think it was uh, in response to a certain kind of fascistic, uh, although, you know, important atmosphere of minimalism that people were trying to get away from or break out of. The other really uh, 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 interesting performance was by Barry Laval, uh, where he, uh, and this is, the one that's on the cover of uh, Out of the Box by Carter Radcliffe. Uh, this was, I think, in 1969 or 70. Uh, it was I, in one Paul Green Street Gallery, and one, at least one of the times he did it, where, where I saw it, and uh, which was 100 feet long. And he just simply put a tape recorder on the, on the wall, on the floor. And then he kind of uh, started running and got up full speed and didn't try to stop and splat against the wall. And picked himself up, came back, repeated it, splat against the wall uh, for, you know, I'm not sure, seven, eight times until basically he couldn't handle it anymore. And so what you had then as a record of the piece was the, the kind of smudges in the wall and, uh, and the tape recording of, the, of the, the splats. But that's really trying to get out of the box. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I mean, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that in the, in the context of art, I mean that part of it, whatever our personal uh, kind of uh, uh, backgrounds or our context were, we were trying to, to get out of something. And that the thing we were trying to get out of was we, we comprehended it as being fairly large as an aesthetic. And. Uh, uh, I, again, you may not see this now. I think that now it's more pluralistic, and and in some sense you could say it's more free, since you can kind of almost you know do you can do this painting, you can do this, you can do very much a, a bronze sculptor, you can do uh, Lucian Fr 
Freud, a kind of a Renaissance-like figure, uh, you get all sorts of things that are totally acceptable, uh, and maybe rightfully so. Uh, then we thought a lot of things were not acceptable. But at the same time, we were, were locked into kind of trying to get, the thing is though, we did get out of it. And uh, because it was such a strong thing to kind of, uh, to, 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 uh, to get out of, I think there was a strong reaction against it. And, and therefore, we had all this work that basically uh, went through the early, I mean, from the late 60s to some point around 1975, 1976. And then all it seemed to start falling apart. And uh, because, and I think it, I think it uh, seemed to fall apart as it defined itself as uh, conceptual art, as it became defined. Uh, uh, I don't think it was the kind of art that could just, you know, become defined and then like kind of stay there. Uh, this coincidentally uh, was uh, I had a, 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 a my best. Friend at the time was a, a, a Gordon Malakar, and uh, and I met him at 112 Green Street, which was uh, the uh, the first gallery in Soho, and it was a non-commercial uh, gallery, and no one even dreamed that they could possibly sell anything. And uh, uh, and that's where a lot of people did, early, including Louis Bourgeois, and Vito, a lot of Vito Vucci's things, and Dennis Oppenheim, and. Uh, and Gordon Mata, and uh, Barry Levar, Bill Bollinger, uh, uh, Alan Sarat, uh, all really, really good artists, uh, did things kind of casually, you know, as they just kind of had something, they kind of threw it in, sometimes literally threw it in, and a lot of times you couldn't tell the art from the, from the kind of uh, derelict floors and uh, walls, and, and it wasn't a white box, it was pretty messy, and it was a basement. And uh, that was the first activity in Soho. Uh, which had now, of course, has become a, a totally different kind of place, our, our thing. And that was in 1970. And uh, anyway, anyway uh, 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 Gordon was also doing uh, uh, some very good things that are documented also in Avalanche. And uh, he, uh, uh, he grew some mold uh, in, on a plate in the gallery. He, uh, 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 and then, of course, he started cutting buildings apart. And, holes out of buildings and things like that, and that's what we kind of know him for, showing uh, he, the photographs of the holes and also the pieces of sculpture that were cut from the buildings. And uh, in uh, 1976, he had an identical twin brother, and, uh, and Gordon lived upstairs from me, and he actually had, he had actually told me there was a space underneath him that was... Uh, Available and uh, that's how I wound up living in the loft I'm living in. And uh, but he was upstairs and we had these different parties and things like this. And then uh, his brother came to visit him from South America and uh, and they were absolutely identical. I, I was in the elevator with his brother and his brother looked. I, I thought it was Gordon. And uh, and he was a painter and I don't know exactly what the motives are, but uh, one summer afternoon, uh, in the middle of the summer, I'm not sure, July, August. Uh, I was in my loft and I heard this commotion and things like that and uh, he jumped out of the window uh, seven, eight stories and uh, kind of split across on the sidewalk uh, in front of Gordon as he was coming back from uh, 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 the Grand Union which was a supermarket. And uh, Gordon just saw this whole thing happening and I think his brother probably could have, I mean whatever he did, out of, uh, uh, I, you know, Jordan was much more known at the time than his brother was. Anyway, Gordon was devastated by it, and uh, and two years later died of uh, stomach cancer, totally riddled by uh, stomach cancer. And he remember he was a fraternal, I mean a, a, a twin from the same egg, and uh, and that was the end of Gordon. And, and uh, coincidentally, not necessarily having anything to do with it, I, it was the end of uh, I think this kind of work, uh, you know, for everybody. I, I, the other thing is that Gordon's loft, and in some sense mine, was the kind of epicenter of, uh, of uh, everyone hanging out and things like that, and parties. And he, Gordon was really a, a kind of charismatic uh, center of it and had a, 
had a gallery called, uh, I mean, I had a, a restaurant called Food, and uh, which was free actually for several months. And uh, and anyway, uh, I think somewhere around 1978, uh, we we had the end of this era, I think. And there was recently a show that started out in um, uh, the Moreau Foundation in. Um, uh, uh, Barcelona, and then uh, traveled to the museums. It was called Behind the Facts, uh, and it was a old art of this era. And uh, it it started actually in I think it's 1965 or 66, and ended in 1975. That was the period of time that she these ping pong tables were actually in these actual ping pong tables were in that show, and it was art produced at that time. And it was just a certain kind of moment of maybe. Uh, Naivete, uh, 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 innocence, and uh, I might I want to add just one more thing before I get away from that era. And uh, I mean, it was called conceptualism, and there was these all these kind of branches: uh, earth art, body art, and then narrative or story art. And uh, uh, and then, but besides that, I think I felt that there was two kind of groups of artists, not so self-defined, but there were the there were the Marxists. Uh, you know, who were actually using Marx's ideas and uh, against commodities and things like that, and thought, well, since the you know the establishment was so shitty, uh, and uh, the war, and uh, also the inequality of women, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, racial equality, all of these things that the quotation Marx establishment was responsible for, we should do art that uh, is against the establishment. And there, and and I, the, Marx was used to kind of back up uh, those. Uh, I, the only problem with that uh, was that the artists that were doing it were very good artists, and it's inevitable. If you're a very good artist and you leave something behind, that thing is going to become valuable. And so, I mean, ironically, the things that uh, uh, these artists left behind, I. Uh, you know, are pretty damn val valuable now, and, and commodities as much as anything else. And there was a, the whole other thing with the photograph, uh, the photograph uh, not being an object, which I thought was silly, since they're uh, thin objects. And uh, and I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to hark that line of, of photograph not being an object because they are objects. And I actually came from a very Lower middle, lower middle class working family. I was actually proletariat, and uh, I had to work for a living and sell things uh, or or become something else. And uh, I had no trust funds or anything kind of backing me up. And uh, and the whole idea of not sell, purposely making things that could never be sold. First of all, I didn't think it was possible, and second of all, I thought it was hypocritical. Uh, although I liked the work of that time. You know. Uh, I would, well, first of all, I was recently on this panel. Well, recently, meaning three three years ago or something like that, uh, in Bar Barcelona, uh, with Vito, Dennis Oppenheim, uh, Peter Co uh, Peter Hutchinson, uh, uh, Daniel Buren. Uh, so all of those are qualified. No, 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 I'm not, no, no, I'm going to make a differentiation about it, but the, that, that's who was on the panel. I, I think a lot of the people that were more uh, kind of Marxist, and I, in some sense, actually, I think that the Marxists were even more than the artists were manifested in what became then of the criticism. I mean, I, I, I will now name, I will now ironically name names of Marxists. Uh, even though this was not 1953, and and and, and, uh, 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 and uh, I mean, uh, uh, well, hmm. uh, see, I, and, mm, I, I would have to kind of, I would have to tend towards the critics who were definitely quoting Marx, but I mean, Daniel Buren was kind of like that. Uh, you know, and uh, at the same time, I mean, his things are wonderfully valuable, and uh, uh, and uh, of course, Karl Henry. I don't. So I never heard him say anything about Karl Marx, but he was always dressed in a kind of working man's kind of suit and things like this. And then I'm sorry, but Hans Hacke. You know, now the, the irony of that is, is that I have, a, you know, he did a, a, a documents 
documentations of, uh, of buildings that were like real problematic with landlords and things like that, I would imagine now that those photographs are worth more than the buildings that he documented, if the buildings still exist. And so, and, and even Vito at this simple, I had a little argument uh, with Vito in some sense, uh, I mean, he said his work was, you know, in so, uh, against, against the war. Uh, what he was doing. I mean, the, the kind of radical things that he was doing in art was somehow meant as a statement against, uh, we're talking about the Vietnam War here, and uh, that they were against that war. Uh, Dennis Oppenheim, see the other group, there was the Marxists and there were the Romantics. And the Romantics were like Peter Hutchison, uh, uh, Dennis Oppenheim, and, uh, and certainly me, and uh, a bunch of people that just were really happy that they could kind of get out there and use any kind of material that they wanted to and make art from it. It was like a, that was the kind of freedom. Where the Marxists were, were definitely trying to put it into this kind of political agenda. So I think that there were, I mean, I don't think that Dennis, I've never, I know Dennis really well, uh, we've never talked about Karl Marx or any, you know, and uh, uh, many other things, but not, not that. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that there was these these groups, but then with thir uh, the, then with what became of the October group of critics, that kind of pulled it in even to the present with their art history book and everything like that, and they, they had very much power after the 70s. But that's the end of the moment. Yeah, that is the, certainly it's at the end of the moment and, and into another moment. And uh, I'm actually not going to talk talk about any moments between 1975 and now. You know. And, uh, and I, I actually, just uh, briefly, I, I did say it was this moment and that moment, and I, I, uh, uh, I, uh, oh, I just wanted to mention one other thing of, of that moment, though. The, the, my favorite film of that time, which was, came out in 1972, and I think in some sense just really seemed to fit into kind of the, what the feeling of the time, uh, which was was seemed to be constantly defining itself, but never becoming defined, or when it did become defined, it seemed to then fall apart. And that, that film is about definition, and uh, it's Last Tango in Paris by Bertolucci in 1972. And this is a really, really wonderfully good uh, film with Marlon Brando and uh, Maria Schneider, uh, who was 22 at the time, and her, I think she was in two films, uh, uh, one was Last Time in Paris with her leading man being Marlon Brando, and then a little later with Jack Nicholson in uh, The Passenger. And that was it for her film career, I think. But uh, 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 Last Time in Paris, uh, Marlon Brando keeps on uh, saying, we don't want any names, we don't have any names. And uh, we're not going to say names, we're, you know, and, uh, and uh, she keeps on wanting to know his name, and he doesn't want to tell her, and he doesn't want to know her name. But then, of course, at the end, he kind of weakens. And he starts defining himself by walking along with her and saying, you know, that he was married, his wife committed suicide, he lived in a flop house, et cetera, et cetera. And then at that point, of course, she just wants to kind of get away from him and starts running and uh, runs up to her mother's house and uh, gets in, to, in the, the, the apartment. And, uh, and he's kind of followed her and he kind of comes close to her. and. Uh, and she says he loves her, and uh, uh, he says he wants to know her name. And uh, she says her name, but as she's saying her name, uh, she also has her father's gun in her hand and, and, and shoots the gun. And so when she says her name, uh, you can't hear it because the shot overpowers the sound. And, uh, and so, in other words, at the moment where he wants to define something, uh, the, the point of definition is also the point of death. And that's probably what came, became of this, like, kind of this moment of this uh, group, uh, this, this work that was being done at the time. It became defined and then it was over with. It might be true of other groups of work as well. Uh, and, uh, and just now, very briefly, uh, uh, we're at this moment, and I, I actually teach a course at School of Visual Arts uh, called This Moment, and we spend, uh, you know, uh, many hours talking about this moment or that moment, and it's always more difficult to define this moment than that moment. Uh, I don't know, there was a philosopher, he said the, the, the bird of wisdom flies at sunset, 
Hegel. That was Hegel. And he wrote a lot about art, and uh, I knew she would know that. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it's, this is not yet sunset uh, for this moment. And, uh, and also, the interesting thing about the definition of our time yet, I don't know in, in, uh, in London, here or in England, but uh, I don't know what you have a name for this decade, but so far in America, we don't have a name for it. And it's already 2008. And uh, we never arrived at, you know, you have the, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and then. Huh? I know, that, that was thrown out there at some point. And, uh, but it, I don't see it ever used, uh, you know, like, right, seriously, you know. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know if this time is, is, is so defined, but this, uh, uh, there's some things socio-political that like, uh, happily might be kind of the same as that past moment that I was just trying to talk about. And, uh, uh, and uh, one, of course, is, at least in America, I don't know about here, there seems to be an unpopular war uh, that keeps on going on and on. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and in America, at least, I, there's an enormous amount of discontent. There's kind of hope, but discontent. And just kind of nauseated and, 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 and feeling that something has to change. And that seems to be like what is at this moment, at the moment. It seems to be almost like a limbo or something like that in America. Uh, but uh, it does seem to be uh, a time of change or like a hope for change or something like that uh, after a period of uh, what we think of as being horrible or stagnation or something like that. And, uh, uh, Art-wise, as I mentioned, I think uh, we've, we've gone through two things. Uh, one is, uh, I think, is this the 40th year of postmodernism? I, you know, so if if it is, if we, I don't know where we want to place. We actually uh, thought in 1971 or two, we thought we were modernists, uh, well, part of that modern era, because we actually. Believed that we, were, we actually really believed that we were doing something new, and that still kind of is, fits in with modernism. The idea that, you, that it's nothing new, or the only thing is new that there is nothing new, is a postmodern idea, and of course, appropriation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all postmodern postmodernist ideas. But uh, so I would kind of define conceptualism as being the cusp, really at the cusp of modernism and postmodernism. In maybe some ways it might have ushered in postmodernism, uh, conceptual art. But I, after that, we had neo, neo, I mean, Schnabel, uh, you know, uh, uh, they called it neo-expressionism, and, uh, and, uh, and David Sally uh, was certainly uh, influenced by uh, postmodern uh, architecture and the convolution of uh, putting together of styles of different kind of things, and, uh, 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 there was no, the, the idea that somehow you could make a shift or change in something and it would be new, uh, I think was lost, but I, I don't know, if we would say around 74, 75, it's, it's, it's kind of, is that 40 years? Even if it's a little later, it's still almost 40 years, if it's not, it's 35 years of what we call postmodernism. I would think, like after 35 or 40 years, we might come up with something else. Uh, in whatever that might be, and that isn't so cynical and uh, and uh, puritanical in some senses or some cases, and uh, agenda ridden, and uh, but are, are just at least something else. And I have no idea what that is. Uh, uh, and uh, the other atmosphere, of course, is pluralism, and uh, I don't know what to say about that if it's positive or negative. In one sense, it might be really positive in the sense it's free. You can. If you want to do this kind of painting, you can do it. If you want to do this kind of sculpture, etc., uh, it's you, you are able to do it and be accepted. And uh, maybe that's a very positive thing. But it seems to be uh, it, it, artistically, it seems that seems to be. Able to, and the, but the other thing is that I don't see any kind of movement that is. Uh, there's little groups or kind of collections of people that might be cross influenced and things like that. But it, it doesn't have the same feeling of a kind of monolithic movement as uh, we thought of with uh, minimalism or prior to that ab abstract expressionism. 
And uh, whether that's good or bad or not, it seems to be like of this time. And uh, uh, and as far as uh, what else I'm doing, uh, uh, I uh, I continue doing um, uh, uh, stories. Uh, what it happened in 1973? John Gibson decided to do a show, and he we discussed it. You know, what should we call it? Narrative art, story art. We decided to call it story art, and uh, and. Uh, uh, a couple of English artists were in it, including Peter Hutchinson and uh, uh, and uh, John Balasari, William Wegman, uh, myself. Uh, I can't think of it, all, all the people. Uh, David Askeval, who was Canadian. Uh, Ilos Kong was in it. And then uh, there was another show I, I followed at 1974, and I continued doing stories and texts, which none of which are in this in this show, until somewhere in the late 70s where uh, I just felt I couldn't do it anymore, didn't want to do it anymore. And I dropped all the, I dropped all the text from my work. I married an English woman uh, which lasted for three months and, uh, and then that was over with and it was a kind of ending of a lot of, you know, and, uh, and so uh, in the early 80s were the, was this kind of uh, void for me. And then I started uh, doing more three-dimensional sculptural things and uh, with photographs in the late 80s, but it was still, the 80s were miserable uh, in so many, I felt in so many different ways. It was, uh, Reagan was president, and I thought he was bad, you know, I, I mean, and uh, he seemed looking pretty good compared to, you know, the president of the state. And, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, but, uh, and then of course, uh, uh, we also, th we thought, how can things get more liberal than this? I once was at a party and kind of, you know, the, the, the guy had borrowed uh, mattresses from all his friends and uh, they were all over the floor. And there was, uh, you know, people writhing on the floor uh, you know, all over the place. And, we, and I looked at my friend, actually, who was Malcolm Morley at the time, and I said, you know, how can it get more liberal than this? And, uh, and, and it didn't. It, it, it changed. It didn't get any more. The pendulum swung, and uh, it became uh, pretty conservative in many different ways, including art-wise, including socially, uh, uh, morally, and uh, of course with AIDS helping out things. Uh, and we thought everyone was going to be dead. And uh, and uh, and then uh, the 80s went by. The 90s went by. And. Uh